guys, my name's Nadine. Welcome to my channel and welcome to my June reading wrap up. Um, June was the historical fiction reader fun and I very much enjoyed that. Thank you um, very much for organising. Oh my gosh, these dogs immediately, as soon as I start filming a wrap up, they, are you that fascinated to come in here? Um, yeah, my dogs are uh, prancing around the place, so sorry about that. Um, so yeah, I've got five books anyway to talk to you about. So the first book that I finished in June was Ruin and Rising, um, which is the third and final book in the Shadow and Bone trilogy by Lee Bardugo. Um, so for me to talk about this, obviously there's going to be some things that could be spoilers, so I will hold this up while I'm talking about it. If you're planning on reading the series and you don't want to hear what I'm saying, just wait until I put this down. Um, so this book begins where the second book ended. The Darkling is um, on the throne. He is ruling Ravka. Alina and Mal have gone underground quite literally and they are under the protection, the dubious protection of the Apparat and his followers who all revere Alina as a saint. Um, it is very much more like she's imprisoned there rather than being protected. Um, but she has a plan to gain more power for herself and um, to give her the power to take back Ravka and to defeat the Darkling. And to do that, she has to find the mythical Firebird, which is the final, um, what was the word? Amplifier, that's the one. It's the final amplifier that she needs for her power. Um, but there is a price to everything and it's a potentially a, not a price that Alina is willing to pay. Um, overall, this was quite a satisfying end to the series, I thought. Um, the only thing really that I would say, and it's quite a small gripe really, is that I preferred the side characters to the main characters. Um, the, the main characters were a little bit dull, really. Um, where the side characters had, I don't know, a little bit, a little bit more personality to them. Um, but yeah, it's not a particularly deep read, but it is an entertaining one. So there was that one. Um, next is the Mad Women's Ball by Victoria Mass. So this was a book that I was most excited to read for the historical fiction readathon. Look at that gorgeous cover. Um, it's set in Victorian Paris. Uh, in an asylum. Um, so, you know, tick tick. Um, I have been dreading actually talking to you guys about this because you know when you have a feeling that it's going to be a really popular book amongst you know a lot of readers. But anyway, <laughs> uh, generally I love things in old asylums. I love things about the history of mental health. As a psychologist myself, I find it fascinating and um, horrifying and shame inducing at times that, you know, people were treated the way that they were. Um, so I was really, really looking forward to reading this. It follows two main female characters. The first is um, Eugenie, um, who is a young woman who is institutionalized by her family when she exposes herself as a medium. She can see ghosts. Now this is presented as fact in the book, so it is not madness, she can actually see these ghosts. Um, the other character that we mainly follow is Genevieve, who is a senior nurse at the facility, and she has dedicated her life to working in this place, and in particular for Dr. Charco, who she um, greatly, greatly admires. So, this book made me feel quite angry at times and not not just at the treatment of women um but it was the fact that the author felt the need to talk down to the reader at repeated intervals so she would tell you this story and then kind of have a little section where she would then tell you what had been happening in the story again and basically how you should feel about it you know there would be a chunk of story and then oh this is what's been happening and um it was horrifying because 
and really do you know what if you'd have told it me effectively in the first place then you shouldn't have felt the need to actually go over and give me another telling um so there was that that really started to grate on me um i've made some notes here let me just make sure because i feel like i could get quite ranty um also all of the characters in here felt like just caricatures of people that you would find in a mental asylum in um sort of victorian paris you know if i was to sit and brainstorm it you know you'd have some prostitutes you'd have a tart with a heart you know, you know you would have these these people but there was no real flesh on the bones i didn't care about anybody in this book at all because they were all just literary devices and also the, the whole mediumship thing i didn't see the point in it at all it would have been really interesting had she spent some time actually fleshing out these characters and maybe exploring spiritualism the rise of spiritualism in victorian society is a really really interesting topic so that could have been explored but actually the only reason i could see for um whatever her name was eugenie to be a medium was that it gave her a reason to be institutionalized and it gave her an easy way to win people over while she was there it would have been far more interesting i think had she been institutionalized because she was an outspoken woman who had um, strong opinions against patriarchy and that maybe she could win people over to her way by detailed strong arguments i don't know maybe it's just me i've purposefully not looked at reviews on this because yeah <laughs> i think i think that sort of covers it wasn't my favorite read wasn't my favorite read um next though i read west by caris davis which i loved thankfully praise the maker the the next book i read was a good one this is a really interesting little book so this is set in um early 19th century america um, and it follows <coughs> Cy Bellman and his daughter Bess. Now, um, Cy is uh, a settler. He has been raising his daughter alone since the death of his wife some years before. And then when he reads in the paper about the discovery of some huge bones out west, he becomes obsessed by what kind of creature this could have belonged to. And he becomes obsessed to the point where he actually packs up, leaves his daughter in the care of his sister and travels out west. He takes the arduous, dangerous journey out west alone. There were times in this book that I genuinely felt frightened for both Sai and for his daughter Bess. You could see these horrible dark things swirling around them and oh gosh, somebody needed to protect these people. Um, but yeah, this was a very small book, but it packed a punch. I loved it. Um, next, then, I read Agatha Raisin <coughs> and The Love from Hell by M.C. Beaton. You know, I didn't read as many of these Agatha Raisin books originally as I thought I did because I'm into new territory. So that's quite nice. I've got like 20 something books, I think, left to read in the series. So... Um, again, I will hold this up, so if you don't want anything spoilery, just, you know, mute me. Um, so, Agatha and James had gotten married in the, at the end of the last book. But it isn't the wedded bliss that Agatha had always dreamed of with him. Um, they are constantly arguing. James is always trying to change her. And, yeah, it is really, really not going well. And so, then, James disappears. Um, there are signs of a struggle there's blood in his cottage and yeah he is gone it's like he's disappeared off the face of the world nobody can find him no no trace of him at all um, then there is another murder and uh, secrets surface about James um, that Agatha had no idea about and um, she teams up again with Sir Charles Fraith and they go trying to discover what on earth is going on, where James has gone, and who's going around killing people. So I, I enjoyed this series. I love it when Agatha teams up with Charles, actually. I think he's such a fun character and he's quite good for her. They are very much opposites 
um, but they bounce off each other really nicely. I, I like I like that mix. And I was quite relieved when James disappeared because I don't really like him very much. He's a bit of a a-hole, really. So yeah, I was glad to see him gone for a bit. Um, but yeah, that was good fun. I'm looking forward to the next one. I'm looking forward to seeing how relationships develop in the next one. Um, next then, back onto the historical fiction reader farm. <clears throat> I finished The Duke and I by Julia Quinn. That's the first Bridgerton book. Um, so it's set in Regency London and the first instalment of this series follows Daphne Bridgerton who's on the hunt for an eligible husband. She's had a few offers but from nobody that she is interested in. Um, just sort of fat old boring people I think really. Um, so then she meets Simon who is the titular Duke. He is also her brother's friend. She's never met him before and they kind of hit it off. But Simon doesn't want to get married. He is always pledged that he will never, ever marry. And um, he is quickly, quickly fed up by being hounded by all of the society mothers looking for a, a good husband for their daughters. So he and Daphne um, come up with this plan where they will pretend to be courting so that the mothers leave him alone and men start seeing Daphne as this desirable creature. I think it's fairly obvious what, what's going to happen in this one. I enjoyed it to start with, um, probably like the first half, I would say. I enjoyed it. It's quite entertaining, frothy fun. Um, but then after that, I found I was just sort of wanting to get through it, really. Um, but I think it was just because I don't really like the Simon character that much. And then some of the choices that Daphne made, I found to be extremely questionable. Um, I didn't really like that. I will read the next one in the series, but just not quite yet. But I might give the TV series a go, I'm not sure. So yeah, there was that one. Um, next then, I did have a DNF. I haven't got a picture of it or anything. Um, it was called Abigail Hall by Lauren A. Forry, but it was it was really boring. Wait a minute, let me see if I can find a picture. Oh, it was really awful, sorry. It was really boring, that's not a very good review, is it? So this was set in London. It started off in London just after the war. With these two girls, uh, sisters, who were being looked after by an aunt or something like that. Um, where is it? Abigail Hall. I'm sure it was Abigail Hall. Lauren. Um, so yeah, I thought it was going to be really good because it looks like really, oh gosh, come on, sort of a gothic kind of feel. Um, and I think it, it, it goes to an asylum in Wales. I'm not sure if it's an asylum or just like some sort of stately house and it's meant to be quite ghostly and supernatural, but yeah, it just, it just, it wasn't very exciting. I read about six or seven chapters of it and then I just can't be bothered anymore. <laughs> There's so many other good looking books out there. I'm not wasting my time on that one. Um, I started several other books that I haven't finished yet. So I started Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantel. I'm loving that. Unfortunately, it's on my Kindle and I just haven't been picking up my Kindle very much. Um, but I'm about 20% into that. Um, I also... I've started reading this. I've read An Inspector Calls um, by J.B. Priestley, um, which was so good. I didn't study that at school. I know a lot of people do here in, in England, um, but we didn't do that one. But it was really, really good. Um, so this is a play. I think it was written just after the war, but it's set before the war. Um, and it's about this uh, middle class family all sitting down to dinner. They're celebrating the engagement of the daughter to the son of the father's um, business rival. So everything, happy, happy, happy. Oh, isn't the world amazing? And then knock, 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 an inspector has called. And this inspector is um, investigating the gruesome suicide of this young working class woman who everybody denies having anything to do with. But as he begins questioning 
the family members in turn, it turns out that actually everybody did know this girl and they've all had something to do with her life. Um, so yeah, it's really, really interesting, you know, themes of justice and class. Um, uh, yeah, it was, it was really good. Um, I also have read Time and the Conways, um, which was also really, really good. But I'm, I was thinking about doing a video once I finished all of the plays in this book. I was thinking about doing a video discussing all of them. So yeah, look out for that. If you're interested in that sort of thing, let me know. I'll, I'll definitely be interested in doing it. Um, I started as well Ross Poldark, the first book in the Poldark series, but I'm not very far into it, like 30 pages. And I finally started Gone with the Wind. And the day I started it, I put it in my bag thinking that when I take my daughter to the park, I'm going to read it. And my drink bottle burst and absolutely wrecked it. 20 years this book has sat pristine on my shelf. And the day I start reading it, I break it. Um, but yeah, I'm not very far into this one either. Again, about 30 pages. Um, but yeah, it's looking good. Um, the only other thing I read was this with my daughter, The Twits by Roald Dahl, and she loved that. So yeah, that is my June in a nutshell. Uh, sorry if it got a bit rambly. Uh, sorry if it got a bit ranty. Um, hesitatingly, let me know what you think of these books. I'm sorry if you love Mad Women's Ball. And um, yeah, I was mean about it, but I, I can't lie. <laughs> um, but I'll speak to you guys very soon. Bye.